On behalf of uh, Reverend Jan Rothenberger and family, I want to welcome you to the celebration of the life of Evelyn Rothenberger. I have had the honor and privilege of working alongside Evelyn's daughter, Jan, for 25 years in ministry to the poor in downtown Toronto. And over the years, I have picked up uh, a good relationship between Jan and Evelyn. They vacationed together, they hung out together. Uh, the bond between a uh, mother and a daughter, when it is healthy, is a mighty bond. It's arguable if there is anything stronger on the planet. The relationship between a mother and daughter is like no other. No matter what the struggle is, it is a soul connection that carries you through a lifetime of smiles and tears. A mom is a daughter's first friend, and in life becomes her best friend. And so we are, and we are aware of this great loss for all who mourn today, and especially for close family. And we join our hearts with family members as they mourn the loss of Evelyn. Good afternoon, my name is Matthew Parker. I'm a pastor with the Young Street Mission. So as we gather today, I would encourage you to remember, if you can, as we celebrate Evelyn's life today and say our goodbyes, that when tears kind of well up within your eyes, feel free to release them. Uh, tears are a language all of their own, and really God can only fully understand them. We will have the opportunity in a few moments to hear from Jan, as well as from Tom, Evelyn's son-in-law, and Lindsay, Evelyn's godson. And we will have a chance to hear from each other today, because we want to give you an opportunity to share your thoughts about Evelyn. Let us pray. God, we thank you that we have this opportunity today to come and to celebrate Evelyn Rothenberger's life and to join our hearts in remembrance and in sorrow for the loss of this wonderful woman. We thank you that we are not alone in our grief. We do not stand in isolation from one another or from you. We are here with each other, socially distanced though we may be, in order to join hearts. And we are here in your presence, holy God. As we celebrate Evelyn's good life, would you comfort all who mourn? Would you lift up the heavy-hearted? Would you speak words of comfort? May we hear, peace, dear child, I am with you always. And may our ears be attuned to your comforting presence by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You should have received the bulletin when you came in. And on the inside of that is a hymn called Abide With Me, and Jan requested that we sing with you today. Yeah. 
that may be watching, and um, family and friends across the continent, uh, thank you. Uh, my warmest love and thank you to all of my mother's friends that are here and tuning in. Uh, she had many friends through the years. It's still hard to comprehend everything that's happened and believe my dear mother, Evelyn Rothenberger. Evelyn Rothenberger, in Glasgow, Scotland, during World War II time. She was born to Sarah and Alexander Anderson, and she was the firstborn and had three younger siblings, Billy, now residing in England with his wife, June. Her sister, Irene, who passed away when she was in her early 40s. And then the baby of the family, Ronnie, who just passed away a year and a half ago. My mom grew up in Rolls Royce housing, provided for the employees working there during the war. And on each side, this thing is really in the way. And each, I know I'm short. On each side of them, uh, they had great neighbors. They had the Clinks on one side and the Keys here. Bess was my mom's best friend for life, and her younger sister Anne, who was my Aunt Irene's good friend. So they remained to the Anderson family. Many of the Keiths and the Clates kept in touch. And my mom is also the godmother of Bessie's son, Lindsay, and he will be up here later. My mom's cousin, Anne Clark, was also a regular visitor to the Anderson household. As her mom, Aunt Lizzie, was my grandmother. Anne was very outgoing. My mother was very quiet. And they always wanted to be like one another. A story that my grand shared several times um, was when my mother was a toddler, she became almost died. And the doctor told that they had bought for her they were told to give it to her now because she might not make it. And so they gave her that doll. And when my mom got that doll, 
She loved it so much. She just became so excited and she hugged it and hugged it and she wouldn't let it go. And by hugging the doll, she ended up getting stronger and so recovered from the scarlet fever story. And I've been thinking a lot about it lately, only wishing that there was a doll now that could have given her that strength. As my mom grew up, she was quiet and shy, an introvert who loved to read and got lost in her books. My grandfather bought her a bicycle to encourage her to get out more, and it was a time when most kids never had a bike. Now she had a bike. And she was a good student at school, finished around age 16 or so, and then she too got a job at Rolls-Royce where her father worked. Only her job was in the payroll department. And that kind of scared my grandfather a little bit because now his daughter is going to know how much he earns. <laughs> and so he took my mother aside and he said, don't tell your mother how many days the men just handed over the money to the women to run the household. And then they kept the rest in their pocket for their pub money. My mom always kept a secret. In her early Canada, she had known a couple that had already come before, so she had some connections. And at the same time, her cousin Anne was making plans to immigrate to the USA. So in 19 across the Atlantic, Anne landed in New York. Evelyn came to Toronto. She ended up getting an apartment with a, a bunch of uh, British girls. And her friend that she was supposed to come over with backed out at the last minute. And so, it was a big step for my mother, you know, a young, shy, Scottish lass to end up coming by herself, but she did it. And from England and Scotland on Avenue Road, and then they moved to Selby Street just off Sherburn. And she got an office job on Spadine at King for importer-exporters, and she loved those guys. They treated her like a queen, and she had to actually learned to ask for her first raise with them, and they gave it to her. <laughs> but all the British girls, they like to go to the German club on Sherburn Street, because as my mom put it, the German boys were polite and they liked to dance, whereas the British boys just preferred the pubs and drinking. My father, Harry Rothenberger, who had just immigrated from Nuremberg, Germany, and lived in Parkdale Rooming House, he, too, had come across the ocean for a new life with two of his friends, Dieter and Herbert, and they remained family friends with them till to date. Evelyn and Harry's first official date was Christmas Eve, 1957, where they danced to Jingle Bell, Jingle Bell, Jingle Bell Rock. Do you know that song? And so that was their song. And they fell in love despite my father not being able to speak the best of English. They married July 5th, 1958 in Trinity Lutheran Church on Sherburn Street. And they lived in Parkdale in various apartments around that area. I came along a year later and my sister another year after that. So, like I said, they lived around Parkdale, High Park area, my mother got a job at General Electric on Lansdowne between Davenport and DuPont. And my dad worked in the steel industry. When I was six, they finally were able to buy their first home, a semi in Clarkson area of Southwest Mississauga. And I don't know how my mother did it every day, but she did and was out the door by seven. My dad dropping her off to her carpool before he went on to his work. And it was then making dinner and doing her chores. She seemed dainty, but she was a Trojan. Never called in sick, always faithful, kept a clean and organized house, would entertain on the weekends or go somewhere and visit friends. And she made great friends through her life, many through work, through neighbors, um, the German crowd, the Scottish crowd, my folks had a lot of friends through the years, especially that Scottish and German crew. And sometimes they mixed because a lot of the German guys ended up, they also had great neighbors too. Every so often, 
She was completely humble, <coughs> sweet, gentle, easygoing, mild manner, and honest to the core. Even, you know, sometimes I would encourage her to tell a little fib when she needed to, but she never would. <laughs> There's a scripture that always reminds me of my mother. It's when Jesus says, the meek shall inherit the earth, because my mother was meek. I always thought of her sometimes as Bambi, she reminded me, you know, with the big brown, soft brown eyes. And I don't think I ever heard my mother raise her voice my whole life. She could let you know if she was upset without ever having to resort to that. She had a calm temperament, and my father was completely the opposite. <laughs> Bold. <laughs> loud, outgoing, and yet they were perfect, totally complementing one another. And let me tell you, it may not have seemed it on the outside, but Evelyn knew how to handle Harry. She never <laughs> argued with him. She just knew when the time was right to make the point she wanted to make, and she always got what she wanted. She was a true diplomat. <laughs> That's what the politicians need today. Somebody like her, a peacemaker. My mother remained close to her family overseas despite being far away, and many of them came over to visit numerous times, as well as we, us going there and my folks going there. And my grand came over numerous times, usually every couple of years. And my mom, my mom loved spending time with her mom. Her, my grandmother was, was outgoing and popular and just very easygoing like my mother was. Actually, the whole Anderson clan in Scotland were an incredible family, the nicest people. Her siblings, her parents, her cousins, aunts, uncles. You know, I never heard of family conflicts of gossiping. They were all really laid back, easygoing, kind, and people liked being around them. My father loved the Scottish culture. He loved my mom's family, and he even wore a kilt proudly, the Anderson Tartan. Growing up, I didn't always appreciate my family, but I soon learned how blessed I really was. Every Sunday, we'd have a roast beef dinner. My parents would always have friends around, or, or they would take us to their friends who also had kids, and we would play. For years, they were members of Clarkson Road Presbyterian Church, where they met many friends as well. And they took my sister and I, when we were little kids, to Hyde Park and Sunnyside, and they always made sure that we got out. They got, made a lot of self-sacrifices so that Carol and I could have things that they didn't have. And they modeled hard work, honesty, and all-around good values. In the late 70s, their hard work paid off and they were able to buy a bigger house in a different area of Clarkson. And when GE, General Electric, finally closed its doors on Lansdowne, my mother transferred to the office in Mississauga. And she even braved learning how to drive, getting her driver's license. That was so big for her, she was so nervous. And she bought her first car, an orange gremlin with a white racing stripe. <laughs> And then now she could drive herself to work. But I'll never forget the first time we went out in that brand new car. She took my sister and I to the mall. And when we were in the mall, she kept turning to us and saying, could you run out and make sure the car's still there? Please, <laughs> like every 10 minutes, she was so nervous. Uh, my mom was a little naive sometimes. She had that innocence about her. And she always saw the good in people and my father was very protective of her, and they had a good life together, traveled a lot, did road trips, went dancing, and to a lot of functions. They taught us independence, and they trusted Carol and I to be responsible. Carol was a lot like my mother, quiet, wise, with an inner strength. After working at GE for 28 years, my mom retired early at 55, and my folks moved to the Port Dalhousie area of St. Catharines as my dad had a job out that way. Carol and I were already long gone out of the house. My parents were early empty nesters. 
But they lived in uh, St. Catharines seven to eight years until my father retired and then moved back, getting a townhouse in Burlington. They enjoyed a short time of retirement together until my father passed in 2004. And this was a hard time for my mother. She missed him terribly and all the things they did together. She loved being a couple and, and going out dancing and doing the things they did. I remember having to show my mother how to put gas in her car because she never had to do it. My father, he was a gentleman, he would take her car and always put the gas in for her. He treated her like a lady. He even brought her home flowers and thoughtful gifts. And on Valentine's Day, he would always wear his heart boxer short underwear for her. <laughs> <laughs> but Evelyn's inner strength got her through. She sold the townhouse and she bought a condo in Oakville on Bronte Road by the lake where she's lived for the past 15 years. She kept up with all her friends and her family um, here and abroad, and she even made a bunch of new friends at the condo. Some of them are here today. Thank you for being here or watching. Uh, she loved to uh, go for lunches with them, um, visit each other, go to the mall. And my mom also loved visiting Carol and Tom. We became part of that family with Tom's kids, Tamara and Ari, his father, Billy, who also just passed away this year and his wife, Magda, who passed away a couple of years ago. And Tom and my mom grew a, a strong, special bond. Evelyn was a young 84-year-old. She loved going out and about in her Sunfire car, meeting her friend Bess in Burlington every Friday before the pandemic came about. They would go out, go to Fortino's or somewhere. And then she would have special lunch dates with her GE friends, or other friends uh, from the past. She loved going out for lunch and she loved her friends at the condo. And I say thank you very much to the people at the condo for looking in on her, you know, in the last little while when she was, wasn't doing as well. Um, that was very much appreciated. 2011 was a really hard year for my mother. My sister passed with cancer and at the same time my gran in Scotland also passed three days before. My mom was with her mother when she passed, and um, Tom and his kids and myself were with Carol. But I didn't have the heart to tell my mother before she boarded the plane, so I had to tell her once she arrived. Losing her mother and her daughter within three days really took a piece out of, out of her. It was after that that I thought we should go away for a while, so we did a road trip to Cape Cod, and we visited my dad's friend Herbert in New York State. A year later, we met um, her cousin Anne from California. We met her in Pennsylvania. And the one she wanted, and it was just absolute peace, listening to the music. She was easier to travel than with any of my friends I've ever had. We had a separate wallet that we'd pool our money together. It was called the Kitty, and she ran it. Just like she ran the money in our household my whole life. My dad handed it all over the money to her. She paid the bills, she did the, she did the taxes. My mother was really smart like that. Evelyn was modern and she was with it. She even adapted to the technological age. I got her set up on Facebook and she could keep in touch with her friends from afar. And we got to be in touch with our, our family in Germany and, and all of her family in Scotland as well. She, was, she always dressed nice, but she wasn't fancy. She enjoyed simplicity, and she never wasted money on things that weren't necessary. She loved murder mystery books and movies. She enjoyed shows like MacGyver and Columbo and others alike. And she loved all kinds of music. Shelton, Barbara Streisand, Keith Urban, and Rod Stewart. White daisies were her favorite flowers. She enjoyed politics. Coronation Street, award shows, fish and chips, Swiss chalet, friendships, chocolate, scotch pies, mince and tatties, giving to others, and she was an incredibly thoughtful person. She always liked to give little gift bags to people. 
Even when I went to visit her, she would always send a gift bag home for Agnes, my neighbor, who's also a Glasgow girl. Uh, she'd pick up Dutch cookies for another friend of mine that she knew liked them. You know, um, well, you'll talk to you later, Tom, but she always have something for Tom, for care, for anybody. Even when the computer guy came to fix her computer, she'd have chocolate bars for her. <laughs> or uh, when, you know, the cleaning lady would come, she would always have stuff for her and her children. She was incredibly thoughtful in every way. And every time I saw her, she always had something for me. Even if it was gum, you know, a body spray, whatever. Um, just always so considerate. Her generosity was enormous. And she gave to a lot of charities. She loved being outside by the water. She loved cats. And we always had one growing up. And she became known in her building as the cat lady because she always looked, fed people's cats when they went on holidays. And she, she grew to love dogs too when Carol and Tom got Saskia and Fiona, always giving them treats and they knew that she would spoil them. Oh, so much to say. She loved to go around in her car to Hopedale Mall, stop in at Sobeys and so on. When I got a call at the hospital on 5 a.m. September 24th, telling me that the infection was overtaking her and she didn't have long, I was shocked and I rushed there and I prayed the whole way, God, please let me get there before she dies, please. I just don't want her to be alone. And thankfully, I got to be with her, to hold her hand, to rub her arm, to stroke her cheek. And I knew she knew I was there. And then I sang Amazing Grace to her. And she took her final breath as I sang the last verse. She always told me she wasn't afraid to die. She was ready. I just hoped it wouldn't be too soon. But she did live a good 84 years of life. And she touched and blessed many through the years. And I was blessed to have her as a mother. Everyone liked and loved Evelyn. There was nothing bad you could ever say about her. And despite her being a shy, introvert person, she sure was friendly and popular. There's an old Scottish saying that says, no Scotswoman ever dies. She simply goes to the land she loves, Bonnie, Scotland. So I guess Scotland is a reflection of heaven. And I'm just going to close with Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thy art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And thou prepares a table before me in the presence of mine enemies and anoints my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all of the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you. Good. Tom. That was beautiful, Jan. So many memories. Uh, there are several recurring themes that come up when anyone who knew Evelyn speaks about her. They speak about her extraordinary kindness, her gentle nature, her friendly disposition, her selflessness, her caring, 
her keen interest in the lives of her relatives and friends, her loyalty, and her perseverance. I came to know Evelyn in the early 90s when I began seeing Carol. I remember visiting Evelyn and her beloved Harry for the first time at their house in Port Luzi, which is where they lived at the time. Evelyn's warmth and welcoming nature were evident right from the beginning. Carol and I ended up spending 18 glorious years together, the last 11 as, as husband and wife, so there were many more visits and get-togethers to come. As I reflected upon the 25 plus years that Evelyn was part of my life, I realized that in every visit, every meal shared, every phone conversation, what she gave me in so many different ways was a feeling of comfort. Comfort that she cared about me and my family. Comfort in knowing that she listened to and absorbed whatever I might be sharing with her. Comfort in her keeping up family traditions. Comfort in the fact that she never, ever appeared to be in a bad mood. Comfort in knowing that there were still people like her in this world. Almost every time we got together, Mom had a bag of chocolate, candies, and cookies, all prepared for us. From the time that she found out that I liked licorice all sorts, every one of those care packages contained a fresh bag of them. I remember that Carol and I begged her to stop with all the goodies because we couldn't resist eating them all. <laughs> that fell on deaf ears, and she, continued, can, uh, and she continued that tradition to the very end. And you could also always count on receiving a good old-fashioned birthday card in the mail every year. My dad, who passed away earlier this year, adored Evelyn and Harry, as well as Jan. He was always so excited every year to receive this card. These are just some small examples of how thoughtful she was. No matter what life threw her way, she was always so accepting. Along with welcome, welcoming me, she also made my children, Tamara and Ari, immediately all feel like we were part of her family. My Jewish family and I reveled in spending many Christmases at the Rothenberger home, always decorated and full of love and warmth. She continued to ask about them in every conversation we had as if they were her very own grandchildren. Later on, after Carol passed away, I introduced Karen, my current wife, and Evelyn and Jan once again were immediately accepting and welcoming towards her something I did not take for granted because not everyone in her situation would have been so well. All this despite having to endure some tragic circumstances during her life. She lost her sister to cancer at a way too young an age. In 2004, Evelyn lost the love of her life, her husband Harry, again to cancer. He could come across it as gruff at times, but there was no question how much he loved and adored Evelyn as she did towards him. And as Jan spoke about, there was the, there was May of 2011, a period of time that dealt her with exceptionally cruel blows, a time that I will certainly never forget. Her beloved daughter Carol had been battling colon cancer for over two years, and finally at the beginning of that month, on mom's birthday, we had to share the news that the cancer had overwhelmed Carol's liver and that there was nothing more that could be done. Still at the time, Carol felt good and strong and was still carrying on as if everything was normal, with the resolve that she had obviously inherited from her mom. The doctors predicted that Carol had three weeks to, th three, weeks to three months to live. Very shortly thereafter, her 93-year-old mother, Fran, took ill and was in peril. With Carol still strong, Evelyn flew to Scotland to be at Grand's side. Grand passed away on May the 16th. Then suddenly Carol took a very steep decline and by the 18th was in a hospice for terminally ill patients. I called mom that day and she arranged the first flight available, which was overnight May 19th and 20th. Sadly, on the evening of the 19th, Carol passed away just before mom was scheduled to get on that plane. 
Jan and I agreed that we would not tell Mom before she got on the plane. The following morning, Jan picked Mom up at the airport and delivered the devastating news. Imagine losing your mother and your daughter within three days of one another. Despite enduring these, tra enduring these tragedies, Mom would find a way to move forward. After Harry, after Harry passed away, she sold the house that they were in at the time and found a lovely condo in Bronte on the shores of Lake Ontario. There she started a new life and made a whole new group of friends, many of whom are here today and are viewing on the live stream. She even managed to carry on her sunny disposition after Carol's passing, but as Jane shared with me, before I wrap up, I want to recognize my sister-in-law, Jan, who, despite the distance between them, always made sure that Mom was never felt alone. She visited Mom frequently and took her out to various places, whether it be Swiss Chalet or a nearby town. Jan also arranged an annual trip to Florida for her and Mom, something that Mom seemed to really enjoy. Mom and Jan were just so connected. Jan amplifies the caring and selflessness of the entire family, from Gran to Mum to Carol, and in some extraordinary ways, helping people in our society who need it the most. Mum, rest in peace. You so much very, you so very much deserve it. Thank you, Todd. Let's invite Lindsay Ewan to come and share. Children at times we probably either heard it in person or, or seen it in a movie where children their child says to their parent or parents, you know, what'll happen to me when you know something happens to you. And that question never in my life entered my mind until I was thinking of my Aunt Evelyn because she took her position as my godmother to be very serious. And I knew from the time I was little, I just had this sense that if anything ever happened to my mom, I'd be all right and I'd be taken care of. So I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Uncle Harry, who obviously was not my biological uncle, but uh, somewhere in some conversation, Aunt Evelyn must have told him what I meant to her because he took on the mantle of Godfather. And I knew, as in, with Aunt Evelyn as my godmother, Uncle Harry would never let me down. And he never did. And to Tom's point, he did have a way about him. <laughs> but I remember, you know, he would be sitting there in his chair and he'd have his cigar or his pipe, sorry, not, and, he'd, and he'd pass some bit of wisdom on to me and, uh, you know, it was the 70s and, you know, long hair and was going my own way, but he never passed it on in a negative way. 
there was always a kind of little thing to his voice, but you could see his smile behind the pipe and his eyes sparkling. It was always just a little poke, but it was nothing, <laughs> nothing to make me offended or not want to go visit him any time. A, a truly a great man. And as you both said, you know, not exactly two peas in a pod, but when they came together, it was a pod. It was a beautiful pod. And then to Jan and Carol, the same thing as Uncle Harry. I wasn't their biological cousin, but we were, we were family. We've been family ever since. And uh, again, no disrespect to family here and whoever might be watching. Birthdays and Christmases, the one gift I waited for anxiously was from my Aunt Evelyn and Uncle Harry. Because it was always the best gift. Always, always the best <laughs> gift. And um, oh, then that sorry. went on right up until I was 63 in April. And I got a card and uh, a lottery ticket. How many people in here ever got a lottery ticket from Aunt Evelyn? <laughs> exactly. You know, she loved her scratch tickets. But my first one was, um, it was like some Olympics or something. It was in the 76 Olympics, but there, there was a lottery and the funds were to go for the Olympic team or something. It was one of those scratchers. And I won $100. In '76, for you know, a teenage boy, I don't have big money. So, so all through the years, it didn't matter where I lived. The birthday card, the Christmas card would arrive, and then, as Jan said, the best as Aunt Evelyn referred to my mom, although my mom prefers Elizabeth, they would meet religiously every Friday <clears throat> at Fortino's for a cup of tea and a muffin or a little chat. And that went on. I mean, they've been friends since so 80 years almost. It's just incredible that they stayed so close. And I didn't see her as often as I should have. Um, but she never held that. Again, as Jen and Tom said, you never felt like you were, that she was going to um, judge you in any negative way. Just, it just wasn't in her to do it. So, but we kept up a pretty good email. Was probably everybody did. Um, <coughs> on Facebook, she was great about posting and stuff like that. And um, again, to to talk about Mrs. Anderson, I'd known her all my life. So when I would go back to Scotland, um, I would go around to see Mrs. Anderson. Not only did it because I liked Mrs. Anderson and she was friends, you know, with my grand. But I knew, and I wasn't doing it to curry favor, but I knew Aunt Evelyn appreciated it, that I went around to see her mom. And uh, I continued to do that right up until I couldn't anymore. And, uh, and then it comes to the last month. I was, uh, I've gone through some things health-wise and uh, getting back to work and getting myself sorted and whatnot, and um, I can tend to put off things, I will say. And uh, we we're, I knew, I knew she was starting not to feel well, and you know, and she was, you know, it was getting worse with her, the, the, the arthritis and everything. And, and uh, I kept saying to mom, "Oh, I got a phone her, I got a phone her," and. and um, I kept putting it off. I shouldn't say I kept putting it off. I just got caught up in other things. So one day, I emailed her and I said, "Okay, you know, we both commiserated because she had well knew about my health issues the last few years." So um, I said, "Well, when's a good time to call you when you know you'd be relaxed and not tired?" She goes, "Oh, I'm okay in the afternoon." And I never called, and now I can't. I miss her so much. Thank you. I love you, Liz. She understands. Okay.
We wanted to give an opportunity if anyone else would like to uh, share a brief story uh, about that one. You come up here.
treats for you, treats in the bag. And uh, so she not only treated us, but treated the cat too. So all of us loved her, and I will greatly, greatly miss her. Would anyone else like to share? Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. Thank you for enlarging our vision and understanding of Evelyn's life. Uh, it's very heartening to hear. Inside um, your bulletin is uh, the words of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The scripture that was requested uh, was uh, John from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, 1 to 9. I'm going to read that one now. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. So I would have told you that I am going to there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. The word of the Lord. We have lost Evelyn, and that is a loss that is felt intensely by those who loved and cared for her the most, those who knew her the best, those who spent the most time with her. Those are the most troubled at her loss, the ones who have to work the hardest to remake or to re-envision life without Evelyn. They must learn to understand life as it must be lived now in the absence of one who was dearly loved. They are the ones with love-soaked grief. They must adjust, and it will take time. It will take healing. It will take faith. And it's indeed faith that we need to have and to turn to now as we mourn the loss of Evelyn. In the scripture today that I just read, we hear the voice of Jesus. And just as he spoke to his disciples in their confusion and their need, as they heard of Jesus speaking of his own coming death, Jesus speaks to us. And those words were simply this, do not let your hearts be troubled. Really? Jesus? And how do we do that? See, I think it's quite natural to be troubled by the death of a family member, of a friend. We feel that loss intensely. We feel the loss personally. And for those closest to the one who has passed on, the most immediate connection feel the deepest pain when that connection is no more. They are the ones wishing that they could go back and savor moments, perhaps previously taken for granted in the ebb and flow of life. But we also see the loss in the eyes of others. And we know that there are likely many who we do not know who have been impacted by Evelyn by her kindness, by her gentleness, by her meekness, who would be saddened uh, and affected by her loss, and we sense the impact. And for the disciples who heard the words, do not, do not let your hearts be troubled for the first time from Jesus' lips, the fear that they were facing 
was the prospect of losing the one that they were coming to know as the beloved, as one sent from God, as one who is God. And their emotions were raw. They were afraid and they were confused. In a very short time, life for the disciples was going to kind of cave in. The world was going to collapse in chaos around them. And at such a time, there was only one thing that I would prescribe to do. And that is honestly to stubbornly hold on to trust. Stubbornly hold on to, to trust in God. The psalmist said this, I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And in Psalm 141, again, the psalmist says, But my eyes are toward thee, O Lord God. In thee I seek refuge. See, there comes a time when we have to believe where we cannot prove and to accept what we cannot understand. Evelyn believed in God, though she was not a fan of people who were pushy about matters of faith. She preferred humble faith, gentle faith, uh, faith evidenced by caring mm -hmm. for others, and she lived that. Uh, live what you believe, just don't talk too much about it, strikes me as being something that she might say. <laughs> If in the darkest hour we believe that somehow there is a purpose in life and that that purpose is love, even then the most unbearable moments become bearable and even the darkest moments, in those darkest moments there is a glimmer of light. See, the disciples were afraid and they were confused. But Jesus was promising that there is a way for a troubled heart to turn. There is something to fill that empty place left behind. And so Jesus says to them, trust in God, trust also in me. You know, find courage, reach deep down, and understand death as perhaps going to sleep in one room and then waking up the next morning in the room where you belong. It is being transplanted from the garden of this world into the garden of God. And so as we gather to say goodbye to Evelyn, we are reminded that death isn't about destruction or separation. It's actually a, a moment of holy transformation that takes us even deeper into life. We, we trade our heartbeat for a deeper place in the heart of God, who is love, a heart that remains active and involved in our world. Cry, heart, but never break. Let your tears of grief and sadness help begin new life. I want to end with a poem uh, by Bishop Brent. We seem to give them back to you, O God, who gave them to us. Yet as you did not lose them in gift, not as the world gives, you give, you take not away. We are yours. And life is eternal, and love is immortal. And death is only a horizon. And a horizon is nothing save the limit of our sight. Lift us up, strong Son of God, that we may see further. Cleanse our eyes that we may see more clearly. Draw us closer to yourself, that we may know ourselves to be nearer to our loved ones who are with you. And while you prepare a place for us, prepare us also for that happy place, that where you are, we may be also forevermore. Let us pray. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that in the midst of our times of remembrance and reflection and of our mourning, you do offer us the comfort of your presence. May the words of Scripture cause us to, to think deeply and to realize our frailties, but also to realize your awesome love for each of us. God, we are truly grateful for the life of Evelyn Rothenberg. We are truly grateful. Help us to gather up the threads of life and to weave with patience and skill and understanding through the remaining years of life granted to us. And may we, our Father, catch a vision of thoughtfulness like Evelyn's toward others, faithfulness like Evelyn's in all of our relationships, ever diligent to live at our best, whatever our talents may be. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. As we pray in your precious name. Jan is going to come now and read the book of Revelation.
Revelation? No? Okay. So we have uh, the committal. We have the ashes of Evelyn. For as much as Almighty God in his great sovereignty has received unto himself the soul of Evelyn Rothenberger, we therefore commit her body to rest, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, ensure in certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I'm going to read what's on the back of your bulletin, book of Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. we leave this place now, O oh God, may we do so not only with the sorrow that has resulted from the loss of dear Evelyn, but also with a new hope, the hope that Evelyn, through faith, now dwells in your presence, free of pain, free of tears, free from all that ever may have hindered her. By your great grace, O oh God, we are assured that those who transfer from this life into eternity, trusting in your great love, are now home, safe in your great embrace enjoying your presence. And now the benediction. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. May the God of peace, hope, comfort, and love be your constant guide. The Lord will watch over you always, and you're going out, and you're coming in, you're rising up, and you're lying down, both now and forevermore. Amen. 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 Thank you very, very much for joining us. Thank you for, for joining us in person here. Thank you for joining us on the live stream. Uh, for those all, all over the world perhaps watching this, uh, thank you for coming to celebrate the life of Evelyn.